you're looking good. Everybody's all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. Oh, let us pray. Dearest Heavenly Father, in this world of yours, we are all separate, yet very related in our journeys. If we choose our journey through life with you, then we glorify you in all that we do. To walk our pathway with divine guidance is the answer to our fulfillment of life. This doesn't mean we escape all challenges or pain, but it does mean that we travel the road of light. But without darkness, how can we appreciate light? Appreciate light? So you are in all of it. Good cannot help prevail in us if we let you be at the helm of our life. Perhaps some of the people here today feel that they're in darkness because they are ill or worried or concerned about major obstacles in their life at this particular time. Or they may be praying deeply for a loved one's health or even a business venture. But today is the day for their connection to you, where you will be so real to them, God, without any doubt, to lead them into safety, into the light. You are always there for us, and all you ask of us is to have faith, to have trust, and you do the rest. We feel your presence. Oh, and we wish to be your emissary. We pray that everyone here in this little chapel will find peace and wholeness and divine connection. That is the most important activity for each and every day of our lives. Whatever anyone seeks in their heart, may they realize that no experience is without purpose in our spiritual unfolding and in our hearts at this time we are grateful beyond measure for your abundant blessings for as bad as we may feel about problems our blessings far outweigh these problems thank you god amen the topic of my service today is it is time to stand erect personally and spiritually. I want you to ask yourselves this. What do I do to glorify God? How much do I really glorify God? There isn't anything that should stop us from our knowing God better and in establishing a deeper foundation in him. So let's determine deep within ourselves just what hindrances we let stand in the way of a deeper knowledge, a deeper relationship to him. Our energies so often are taken up with our worship of possessions, our human plans, and our own performances before others. Even the security of spiritual people are often found in their personal power and their possessions and not in their strife for further spiritual development and unfoldment. And yet, that's the only lasting thing that there is. That's what life is about. That's what goes on beyond our times on this earth forever. So let me give you an analogy of what hindrances we sometimes let get in the way. Like the young alpine climber preparing to ascend the Alps. Into his pack, he prepared the necessary necessities that he thinks are important for the trip, but this load becomes quite heavy. Early in his climb, he is physically exhausted. His body is extremely tired, and through his excessive burden, he finally tells his guide, 
I, I don't know if I can go on. And the guide says, a choice must be made because not only are you hindering your own progress, but also that of the other climbers to which you are roped. So, here's the thing. He must either give up his hope of ever reaching the top or cast aside the excess weight from his pack. Now, does he covet the prize enough to count all these things but lose the sight of his real goal that he may gain the Alpine summit? Spiritually, whatever our hindrance is in, like reaching the top with God, that hindrance must be removed. Otherwise, we lose and also bring down others from our loss. So then we're unable to serve as an example. Our spiritual resistance will be lowered if we choose not to let go of the weights and the hindrances. In other words, it's our excess baggage to our spiritual growth of becoming a better person and of knowing God better each day that we live. We must get rid of some of those things in our backpack, which are hindrances to us. I believe we all need some renewed thoughts of God continuously. Today's doctrine often tells us that God is more of a policeman, a punishing God, of whom we must fear, rather than a kind, loving, and forgiving God, and one who's the, who has the ultimate authority. The value of thinking properly about God is seen in how we talk and how we live our life. We will always act according to how we think. Proverbs 23, 7 tells us, as a man thinks, Within himself, so he is. We hear today so many talks about the necessity of changing our world. Before we see God bring change in our world in this generation and change in our own lives, perhaps we must change a little bit of our own thinking about God and his engulfing love for us. We tend to blame God for every bad thing that happens. God gave us free will as his gift to us. The world destroys the planet, creates war, climbs over people to get to the top, lets the government control their thinking and their lives, but whatever bad there is in this world, God nearly always gets the blame. If we open ourselves to him, we should have true satisfaction in God and in our life with him. The news is getting worse. We all see that to be true. They begin the evening with good evening and then proceed to tell you why it isn't. <laughs> October the 5th, now, this was 2013, mind you. The news reported that a settlement had been reached in a federal lawsuit changing the display of a portrait of Jesus that had been in an Ohio Christian school for over many decades. The outcome was the ACLU won the lawsuit to permanently remove the portrait and the school had to pay damages and legal fees totaling six figures. Well, since then, any religious factor is demanded to be taken down from our schools. And many flags are requested to no longer fly. They say it's political. Also, did you know the U.S. military has furloughed as many as 50 Catholic chaplains due to the suspension of government services, banning them from celebrating weekend mass? At least one chapel 
chaplain was told that if he engaged in any ministry activity, he would be subject to disciplinary action. And another Air Force chaplain was threatened after he offered to forego any pay. At least he wanted to so badly. They were told their contracted services. And since there's no funding due to shutdown, they can't do it even if they volunteer. Now I want to ask you something. Did God do that? Weddings and baptisms were scheduled on the basis which they were told should only take place, that could take place, but not by a priest or other clergyman. Now, isn't it odd that the government found the money and gave the go-ahead to let their football teams play that weekend, but they could not celebrate Mass or any other church celebration? That constitutes any religion, Jewish, Catholic, or, Pres or Protestant. Now, friends, wake up. You ask what you can do? Bombard your congressmen and senators and all politicians pulling that darkness into our whole life. Tell them how wrong they are to stand for such disregard of our Constitution because it's in there. Look, God did not do this. Man did this. Man took God out of our schools, out of our government, and now trying to abolish in God we trust in our currency. How in the world can anyone blame God for what is happening in our world today? But you hear it all the time. Our very actions and wrongdoing play a huge part in our environment around us. We're all too permissive instead of standing up for justice. We should pray, you and I, that we will have to have those at the top level of our government, beginning with the president, to bring God back into our schools, our government buildings, our businesses. We have to correct the present teachings, bring back prayer in all, in all constitutions and put God back where he belongs. And he belongs in everything, everything that we do. And I don't care what political party gets in. If they don't look for God for guidance, our country will fail. But what is happening is the woke has been awakened. You know why? There are wonderful, it's just like biblical times. What Asbury and those people are doing in revivals, it's coming back. It's coming back. That's what we have to celebrate, but that's what we have to pray for. We cannot keep blaming God. Apostle Paul always viewed himself as in Christ, not in jail. His thoughts were elevated far beyond major circumstances and even in the mundane circumstances. He taught us well that the world cannot satisfy the mundane circumstances. He taught us well that the world cannot satisfy, be satisfied with God. It's impossible to be satisfied in anything else. Difficulties of this world do not have to shake us up. God is calling out for you and for all of his people today to live as Paul did, whose lives convey the view that ultimate satisfaction can result only from the knowledge of God. Today, 
I truly see God preparing his own to become much more spiritually strong and to step out in a leadership role with him at the helm, directing and guiding us, not the other way around. And those people he is preparing for you is you. Is you. Right here. The question is, are you letting him? I've been told that strongly. It's you. So is there hope? Absolutely. Look at what the youth started in the revivals. He is standing with those that stand strong and erect spiritually. I must tell you, you are wanting to serve God in your life or you would not be here today. It's up to you and people like you to stand firm for change. And I mean right now, to place God back into our country. That should be your voice heard today as well as your prayers. If you and I don't do it, tell me this, who will? If you're here to worship God and get God back in your life, you're the ones to do it. Present day America is suffering severely from reaping what it is sown as a result of situational ethics. Our morality has become like a, 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 like a musical composition which has no structure. Instead, one improvises rather than play the notes on the score. The person who follows situational ethics justifies all kinds of deeds on the basis that even rules of the Ten Commandments have exceptions. Mm -hmm. Outdated. And most states, they are talking about taking down the Ten Commandments in all of our government buildings. Now, let me tell you, there's a deep humbling of our life when we want to stand erect spiritually. It humbles you. Don't think it doesn't. We continually must search for God to find joy in serving him. We must stand corrected and go forth to work on our weaknesses so that God can use us much more in a powerful way because you see his power is there we have it within us if we follow his direction he needs you he needs each one of you sitting here today and i want to ask you how are you letting him use you he needs every one of us, but often we're so busy in superficial things that we let God lag behind as if he were secondary or even much less in our lives. So you co-create with God. He can't use you without your invitation to do so. Then you're his co-pilot. But don't forget who always is in the pilot seat. So move over. <laughs> None of us really understand totally the great glory of God. Understanding his glory is a never-ending adventure. Suppose you go fishing in a quiet little pond, and as you fish, you spend about 10 minutes at each spot, and after two hours, you have uh, finished the entire circumference of the pond, or at least you thought you had. And as you near the end, you see an outflow of the pond, and looking up in amazement, what do you see? The ocean. And all of a sudden, you're involved with something that's unsearchable. You laugh over how small you feel in comparison. This little pond was just a small extension 
of the ocean. Well, that's what God's glory is like. That's what it's like. For we ourselves limit him when truly he is limitless by what he can do in your life to reach that individual divine mission for each one of you. Galatians 6, 7, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. I'm going to read you about some men and women who mocked God. There are a lot of them out there. We see them every day. They must not have ever read Galatians 6, 7, for it is a spiritual law. For whom you mock, God is the spiritual law that automatically sits in. John Lennon, some of you might remember him. He was a singer. Well, during this interview with an American magazine, here's what he said. Christianity will end. It'll disappear. I don't even have to, to even argue about that. I'm certain. Jesus was okay. But his subjects were too simple. Today, I and my little group are more famous than Jesus Christ. Lenin, after saying that, that was in 1966, that the Beatles were more famous than Jesus Christ, was shot six times the same year. Tanner Credo Navis, president of Brazil, during the presidential campaign, he said if he got 500,000 votes, his party, not even God, would remove him from presidency. He got the votes. He got them. But he got sick a day before being made president, and he died before he even enjoyed one day of the presidency. The man who built the Titanic after the construction of this magnificent ocean liner told a reporter when asked how safe the Titanic would be, with an ironic tone, he said, not even God can sink this ship. Well, I think you know the result. Marilyn Monroe, the actress, she was visited by Billy Graham during a presentation of the show. He said the Spirit of God had sent him to preach to her. After hearing what the, president had, the preacher had to say, she said, I don't need your God. A week later, she was found dead in her apartment. In 205, in Columbus, Ohio, a group of friends drunk went to pick up another friend. The mother accompanied her daughter to the car and was so worried about the drunkenness of her friends. And she said to the daughter, uh, holding her hand, who was real, uh, already seated in the car, my daughter, go with God and may he protect you. She responded, only if he, God, travels in the trunk because inside here it's already full. <laughs> Hours later, News came that they had been involved in a fatal accident. Everyone had died. The car could not be recognized, even to what type of car it had been. But surprisingly, the trunk was intact. The police said there was no way that that trunk could have remained intact. And to their surprise, inside the trunk, was some groceries containing a grate of eggs. None were broken. Wow. Many more important people have forgotten that God is not to be mocked. It's a spiritual law, you see. And by their own thinking and actions, they themselves brought that spiritual law to come into play. God is being mocked in our country today. Watch, for he's about to step in and change things. You can quote me on that someday. 
The unveiling of evil and its intent by people in power will be brought down. He also could use a little help from his fellow man. And guess who that is? Look in the mirror, my friends. God's glory cannot be shared with anyone, but he gives to us empowerment through him. And that power shines. He makes us shine, and his light shines abundantly through us, and that becomes glorious. No one can turn the light out on God's glory. That's why I always stress the importance for you or anyone to realize that my healing gift is for God's glory. I should never, ever get the glory for that for that matter, for it belongs solely to him. I am merely an instrument. What is a musical instrument in itself? Perhaps pretty on the outside, lifeless, dead, until the musician plays it and becomes alive and glorious. My reward is letting his power come through me. And that same power of God that comes through me can come through each of you if you let him. Many ask the age-old question, Sarah, what happens when someone comes for a healing and doesn't receive one? That is part of why the book written about these miracles is entitled Miracle Healing God's call. I cannot create a miracle for anyone. Also, sometimes there are lessons to be learned on the other parts of God's divine plan that may remain unknown to me. So the healing is between God and that person. I pray that God will pour out all of his healing blessings. Everyone that needs to be healed is hanging on, but it is God's decision to heal that person. It is strictly his call. It's not my choice to make, it's his. And you always play, and you also play a part in your own healing. Guess what it's called? Faith and trust. Did you know that many times testimonies are given by people who are just reading the book and may receive a miracle? If you've come to the chapel often, you have heard those testimonies. People that got out of assisted living in a wheelchair and walked out after they read the stories. I wasn't there. It's because the healing they read received by others uplift their spirits to be touched by God. Then they receive their own healing. And that's why we stress the vital importance, importance to give your testimony of what God has done for you. And when you receive a healing and don't share what God has done for you, it is a sin. Because he asks us in Holy Scripture the importance of that. Why? Because it helps your fellow man to uplift them to a place where their faith allows them also to receive. They then receive God's grace in touching them. I always feel that your testimony actually cements the healing. Whatever business you are in, from the janitor to the CEO, you should always dedicate your life and work for his glory, not your own. Man can leave God out of schools, out of books, and even out of their lives. But man cannot leave him 
out of certain problems or mountains that occur in their own lives, and especially at the moment of illness and death. There's that one day that everyone will face God and see his glory for themselves. Once again, no one can ever turn out the lights on God. Nowhere in the Bible does God try to prove his existence except through Jesus, his son. But have you ever considered how much more difficult it is to disprove God's existence? Look at the stars and ask yourself, who made all that? Sometimes I think it must grieve the Lord to see all of his creation glorifying him except man. Stars shine. Sun gives us light, and in so doing, they glorify God. They were created to do so. There's no revolt among the stars out of boredom or rebellion. There's never a blackout in the heavens. Animals also do as they were created to do. Only man revolts, trying to glorify themselves instead of their creator, often even denying him. I've seen miraculous healings take place after several doctors agree there is no hope found in the medical world or nothing they can do. That happened to me. I had cancer, expected three months to live. I'd never been to a healing service in my life. I was a Presbyterian school teacher, uh, um, Sunday school teacher, brought up that way. But saw Catherine Kuhlman on the, uh, on, in an advertisement. I went to the service, and I was completely healed. It changed my life forever. And you know what she said to me? I see this woman in the balcony in a red dress, and I see that God's glory is all over her, and she has been destined for the healing ministry. I want you to know that I was healed on February 20th, 1972, and Catherine Kuhlman died on February 20th, 1976. But not before I did services with her. Yvonne and I went to the Holy Land with her, and she told me over and over, God had anointed me for the healing power. Did I believe it? No. <laughs> I thought that it was the healing for the children that I was caring for, the abused children. It took a Catholic priest that was visiting with Danny Thomas. And Danny Thomas said he knew me, and he said, I've heard about this woman. I want to meet her. It was he who came to me and forced me into his to the healing gift because he was a tremendous healer and took me and put me on the stage and said, pray for these people. I rushed up to him and said, it's like dirt and ice cream. You can't ask me to do that. <laughs> they are here for you. He forced me into it. And when I prayed, the man that had a tumor on his face this size dissolved in front of me. I was more surprised than he. <laughs> and there was a long line then, and I prayed for two and a half hours. That began my healing service. Was that me? No. That was God. That was my mission. God has the same mission for you that's equally important, because if you miss your mission, the cog is out of the wheel. Each one of you are just as important. God's power is something a lot of people don't understand. There are a lot of wonderful doctors that don't block God out. They do what they can do scientifically to help. There are several doctors right here today. They even bring their patients sometimes. You know why they do? Because they know 
and understand who God really is. What we don't understand, we don't want to give credence to. Also, they're afraid if they believe in that miracle, it may dictate their change of thought. Or even worse, they'll have to change the way they live their lives. Some people live their lives calling themselves spiritual, and they're cheating and lying and stepping out on, uh, with others and thinking that's okay with God. Yet I've seen people who claim they're not spiritual and live a life of ha loving others and being a light on this earth plane. We've all known people like that. It's their belief that matters, and it's all in how you live your life, accepting Christ, not what you say you are or are not. Some people claim that they're agnostic and even atheist and yet they live a Christ principle life now like this poem I'm going to read you I was shocked confused bewildered as I entered heaven's door not by the beauty of it all nor the lights or its decor but it was the folks in heaven who made me sputter and ga gasp the thieves the liars the sinners the alcoholics and what we call trash. There stood the kid from seventh grade who swiped my lunch money twice. Next to him was my old neighbor who never said anything nice. Bob, who I thought was rotting away in hell, was sitting pretty on cloud nine, looking incredibly well. I nudged Jesus. What's the deal? I'd love to hear your take. How do all these sinners get up here? God, you must have made a mistake. And why is everyone so quiet, so somber as they look at me? Give me a clue. Hush, child, he said. They're all in shock. No one thought they'd be seeing you. <laughs> so, judge not. Remember, just going to church does not make you a Christian any more than standing in your garage makes you a car. <laughs> every saint has a past and every sinner has a future. Judging is one of the hardest things not to do. Life without God is like an unsharpened pencil. It just has no point. The first two commandments in Exodus 20 reveal God's concern that God gives him glory. That man gives him glory, sorry. The first commandment is, have no other gods before you. The second is, you shall not make an idol. Now, an idol can be money, status, a belief in a graven image. Both of these have to do directly with God's glory. But let me assure you, God does protect his own. His own is all of us who trust and believe in him, and no one is left behind. It doesn't matter what denomination you are, because man-made religions, he made people in every color. We're all God's children. So it's our choice to choose him first and foremost. And when we do, he chooses us for greater things. And we receive his protection. And we are cared for by him beyond description. I'd like everybody to stand and I'm going to read something, then I'm going to read it again with you as you say it. I will always strive to make God's light shine through me. I will always strive to make God's light shine through me. Oh, you did pretty good. I think you should try it again. I will always strive to make God's light shine through me. Ah, oh, that's so much better. Now you can sit down.
You know what God longs to teach us? It is that when we have nothing left but God, we learn that God is enough. When a person suffers and is so hard, just so hurt through the loss of someone close to him, he sometimes strikes out at God and tries to deny God's power. The danger of that is very clear. We're too ignorant to judge God for what appears to be a great loss or failure. I heard a reply about a statement made to a pastor, and I never forgot it, I loved it. The mother who lost her son in an automobile accident lashed out at the pastor, where was your God when my boy was killed? He quietly responded, the same place where he was when his son was killed. If we were to take a stick and put it into a glass of water, it would appear to be crooked. Now, why is that? Because we look at it through two mediums, air and water. It's the same with our understanding of God. His various uh, characteristics, such as his justice, might not even seem straight to us. At times, the wicked seems to prosper and the righteous seem to suffer. It appears that these are unfair events that take place all the time. The problem is not with God, but with us. We view God's proceedings through a double medium of flesh and spirit. Therefore, it's not what God's that God's character is bent. It is that man is not competent to judge. God sees the whole picture, and we can't do that. It's difficult sometimes to accept the stepping stones when they're not always the easy road to follow. They may even have pebbles on them. And what we think as a disaster can well be a divine intervention, making room for far greater things in our pathway, but we can't see it at the time. God uses us all, even when we have impairments. Let me tell you a story about this. So at his Sunday sermon, he asked for three volunteers from the congregation who would be willing to sell the Bibles door to door for $20 each to raise the desperately needed money for the church. Jack, Paul, and Lewis all raised their hands to volunteer for the task. The minister knew that John and Jack earned their living as salesmen and were very likely to sell a lot of the Bibles. But he had serious doubts about Lewis, who was a local form farmer who had always kept to himself because he was embarrassed by his speech impediment. Poor little Lewis sputtered very badly. But not wanting to discourage poor Lewis, the minister decided to let him try anyway. Well, he sent the three of them away from the, uh, with the back seat of their car stacked with Bibles. And he asked them to meet with him and report the results of their door-to-door -door selling efforts to the congregation to the following Sunday. Anxious to find out how successful they were, the minister immediately asked, Now, Jack, how did you make out selling our Bibles last week? Proudly handing him an envelope, Jack replied, Using my sales prowess, I was able to sell 20 Bibles, and here's the $400 I collected on behalf of the church. Oh, that's wonderful, Jack, the minister said. You're indeed a great salesman. The church is indebted to you. Turning to Paul, he asked him, Paul, how many Bibles did you manage to sell? Paul, smiling and sticking out his chest, confidently replied, well, I am a professional salesman, you know, and I sold 28 Bibles on behalf of the church, and here's the $560 I collected. The minister responded, well, that's absolutely splendid, Paul. You're truly a professional salesman, and the church is also indebted to you. Apprehensively, 
the minister turned to Lewis and said, and Lewis, did you manage to sell any Bibles last week? Lewis silently offered the minister a large envelope. The minister opened it and counted the contents. What is this? The minister explained. Lewis, there's $6,400 in here. Are you suggesting that you sold 320 Bibles for the church door to door? And Lewis just nodded. That's impossible, both Jack and Paul said in unison. We're professional salesmen, and yet you claim to have sold 10 times as many Bibles as we could. Yes, that does seem unlikely, the minister agreed. I think you'd better explain, Lewis, how you managed to do this. Lewis shrugged. No, 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 for, for, for sure, he announced. Well, impatiently, the minister interrupted. For crying out loud, Lewis, just tell us what you said to them when they answered the door. Uh, all I, I said was, was would you would you like to buy the Bible for twenty bucks, or would you just like for me to stand here and and uh, read it to you? <laughs> Well, that's called never be discouraged by any problem or impairment that you might have or think that you have. The next time you think you're discouraged, think of this story that I told you. Also this one, when your hut burns down. One day the only survivor of the shipwreck was washed up on a small uninhibited island. He prayed feverishly for God to rescue him, and every day he scanned the horizon for help, but none seemed forthcoming. Exhausted, he, ev he eventually managed to build a little hut out of driftwood to protect himself from the elements and to store his few possessions. One day, after scavenging for food, he saw intense lightning and scurried back to the hut. But when he arrived home to find his little hut in flames with smoke rolling up to the sky, he just felt awful. He felt worse and everything was lost. He was stunned with disbelief and grief and anger. And he cried out, God, how could you do this to me? I've been praying continuously for you to save me. Well, early the next day, he was awakened by the sound of a ship approaching the island. It had come to rescue him. How'd you know I'm here? Asked the weary man of his rescuer. Why, we saw your smoke signal, they replied. The moral to that story is, it's easy to get discouraged when things are not going the way you think they should. And what happens is we lose heart. Because the thing is, God's there all the time. He's working with you all the time. You just can't see it. He's working with you in the midst of your pain and suffering. Remember that. The next time your little hut seems to be burning to the ground, it just might be a smoke signal that surmounts the grace of God, summons it to you. Let's pause a moment and ask, is God's glory so special that we will pay the price? To pay the price of his glory Or is it cheap, costing us very little? If what we do in our life is not good enough for his glory, it's certainly not good enough to continue in our lives. It's not so much what we do, it's how we do it and how we shine for God in doing it. We need to know how to carry God's glory 
into the presence of others, to serve others, and to help bring light into other lives. And when you do that, you can't help but bring light into your own life. That, too, is a spiritual law. Sometimes it's in giving up the win to really win for God's light to shine. I want to read you a story, a real story, a true story, entitled, A Pastor with Guts. I thought you might enjoy this interesting prayer given in Kansas at this opening session of their Senate. It seems prayer still upsets some people. When Minister Joe Wright was asked to open the new session of the Kansas Senate, everyone is, was expecting the usual generalities, but this is what they heard. Heavenly Father, we come before you today to ask for your forgiveness and to seek your direction and guidance. We know that your word says woe to those who call evil good, but that is exactly what we have done. We have lost our spiritual equilibrium and reversed our values. We have exploited the poor and called it the lottery. We have rewarded laziness and called it welfare. We have neglected to discipline our children and called it building self-esteem. We have abused power and called it politics. We have coveted our neighbor's possession and called it ambition. We have polluted the air with profanity, pornography, and child abuse and called it freedom of expression. We have ridiculed the time-honored values of our forefathers and called it enlightenment. Search us, O God, and know our hearts today. Cleanse us from every sin and set us free. Amen. Boy, the response was immediate. A number of legislators walked out during the prayer in protest. But in six short weeks, Central Christian Church where Reverend Wright is a pastor, logged more than 10,000 phone calls with only 47 of those calls responding negatively. The church is now receiving international requests for copies of this prayer from India, Africa, and Korea. This means people are realizing the truth and willing to champion it. That's pretty good. Psalm 5522, friends are God's way of taking care of us. I love that. And sometimes being a friend expecting nothing in return brings huge dividends. Never expected nor anticipated. We call them another gift from God. And this is obviously a true story. The name was Fleming, and he was a poor Scottish farmer. One day, while trying to make a living for his family, he heard a cry for help coming from a nearby pond. He dropped his tools and ran to the pond. There, mired to his waist in black muck, was a terrified boy screaming and struggling to free himself, but he only sank deeper. Farmer Fleming saved the lad from what could have been a slow and terrifying death, even though it meant risking his own life to do so. Well, the next day, a fancy carriage pulled up to the Scotchman's sparse surroundings. An elegantly dressed nobleman stepped out and introduced himself as the father of the boy that Father Fleming had saved. I want to repay you, said the nobleman. You saved my son's life. Oh, he said, I can't accept payment for what I did. The Scottish farmer replied, waving off the offer. At that moment, the father's own son came to the door of the family hovel. Is that your son? The nobleman asked. Yes, the farmer replied. I'll make you a deal. 
let me provide him with the level of education that my own son will enjoy. If the lad's anything like his father, he'll no doubt grow to be a man that we both will be proud of. And that he did. Father Fleming's son attended the very best schools and in time graduated from St. Mary's Hospital Medical School in London and went on to become known throughout the world as the noted Sir Alexander Fleming, the discoverer of penicillin. Years afterward, the same nobleman's son who was saved from the pond was stricken with pneumonia. What saved his little life that time? Penicillin. The name of the nobleman? Lord Randolph Churchill. His son's name? Sir Winston Churchill. You know, I don't know if you're aware of this, but Churchill had a fabulous sense of humor. I'm just going to tell you two or three things he said. Where there's a will, I want to be in it. <laughs> if I agreed with you, we'd both be wrong. <laughs> Women will never be equal to man until they can walk down the street with a bald head and a beer gut and still think they're sexy. <laughs> Behind every successful man is his woman. Behind the fall of a successful man is usually another woman. <laughs> a clear conscience is a sign of a fuzzy memory. The good news in God's promises never change. We can be very secure in that. When we feel at times, I just can't go on, I, I, I just can't. Then is when you must realize that your security is not based on any ability of yours to keep going on. We as human beings change. We have ups and downs in life. But God does not change. And he doesn't vacillate regarding his promises. He is always there, and he deserves our utmost trust. And that is predominantly what he asks of us, trust. And that opens the door for him to do the rest. And that's exactly the kind of life I want for each of you, and of course that I want for myself. Yes, you can be certain if you want to please God, really want to please God, and if you are to obtain the promises of God, then you must do it through the avenue and the channel of faith through Jesus. Hebrews 11:6 says, but without faith, it's impossible to please him. For the, he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. The question we have to ask ourselves is, am I a partaker of God's peace and power? And if not, you're missing tremendous blessings and you're living below your rightful privileges. You're living downstairs instead of the penthouse when you should be living in the penthouse. I'm not talking about a material penthouse either. I'm talking about upliftment in our mind, in our heart, and in our every thought. They should all be uplifted which brings consistent peace and joy that can be found in a, a meager one-room apartment or indeed a mansion. Many things exist in life because we permit them to, not only in the spirit realm, but also in the natural realm. What I want you to realize out of this service is you can be out of bondage and your loved ones can be out of bondage. We're told we are redeemed from this authority that these things don't have 
any legal right to, over us to keep us in bondage. And some of you here today really have come on your last legs. I know because I was told that, that there would be people today that had truly just given up. You know something? Many of us don't act like we're free because we're so conditioned to logic that we have to figure everything out. When we come to the things of the Spirit, it seems, it seems we just know that this must be even more technical than launching a missile. So we come to it with all of our preconceived ideas. And therefore, it's no, no wonder that it doesn't work on our behalf. Because it's simple. So simple that people stumble over it. We are the children of God. We are the children of God. We have been redeemed from the kingdom of darkness. And it has no legal right to hold us in bondage to anything or anyone. So today, these people right here that feel, this is my last chance, I'm giving up, know that to be true. In 1 Corinthians 10.31, it says, all things are to be done for His glory. So it's well to check ourselves out and ask, do we do that? There are two people here wishing to give glory to God because of how God touched their lives right here in the little chapel. Indeed, it is a light unto God, a glory to give to him what he has done for them and how he changed their life completely. Now, I haven't heard their testimony, but I can tell you anyone that gives their testimony, what it does is it changes their life, but it also changes ours. So the first one that will be coming up is Mary Fay, and the other one is Patricia. How do you say your last? Wellicky. I'm so glad you told me because that's not the way I was going to say it. So Mary and Patricia are going to come up and tell you what God did for them. And please speak right into the microphone. Good morning. <laughs> This was a couple of weeks ago. Um, I had pain in my neck. I could not turn my head. And she prayed for me. And <laughs> I also had pain in my back that just was like a knot in one of my mu uh, muscles. And uh, that thing hurt like crazy all the time. And I had a person come on Sunday nights, and she'd say, there's a knot in this muscle. And she'd try to knead it out because she thought she could. She's a Christian. But I, she would start, and I'd say, stop, 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 stop. It hurt so bad. Well, I came here was prayed for, neck perfect, back perfect, I'm healed. Can I give one testimony that when I prayed for somebody? Okay. This was, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. This is, this is, because I, I do work in miracles, but sometimes the devil tries to fool me and puts something that I tell him, you can't hurt me. <laughs> Sometimes he did anyhow with the neck. But anyhow, 3 o'clock in the morning, the phone rang. This was years ago. And I answered the phone, and it was Helen. Her husband's name is Charles. She said, I hate to tell you this, but Charles, we're in emergency. And I thought, I didn't even ask her what was wrong because 
in the background, this nurse was screaming, we're losing him, we're losing him, we're losing him. And I pray in tongues. I didn't say anything. I just, just started praying in tongues, which she was used to me doing. And the Lord spoke to my heart and said this, and I'm, which one I'm going to tell you. I said, don't look at him. Don't look at him. Look away. Look away. Now, for those of you that don't know this, this is the law of agreement that Jesus, when the, when the um, man was told to go and, and dip in the lake, and he didn't want to, and his servant says, if he was asking you for something hard to do, wouldn't you? You know, but this is easy. Go dip. So he dipped, and he was a leper, and he was cleaned. This is law of agreement. This is the same thing that happened to me. When I spoke in tongues just for 10, 15 seconds, then I told her, look away. Don't look at him. Look away. The next thing that happened was the nurse is screaming, and she says, his, his blood pressure was going down, and he was in the process. And she says, it's going up, it's going up, it's going up, it's going up. Now, Charles was my brother. Helen was my sister-in-law. And he lived 10 or 15 years longer. <laughs> and I'd just like to say, start your day with God and go to bed with God and you'll be shocked I could probably show you different people in here that you're if you don't have a ministry your ministry is going to start today if you let it because God wants all of us as his servants he wants us to be obedient and you should put the word, give the word first place, always, and also give it the final authority in Jesus' name. Thank you and blessings to all of you. Hey, and I just, this June, I'm going to be 91. Good morning. Well, I wanted to... Um, give testimony today because I think my experience illustrates a couple of things that Sarah and Drew this morning talk about, that sometimes you don't get your healing right away. It can take time. And that the spiritual component is actually very important in the healing process. So let me tell you, there'll be a little I'll talk about my medical background, you know, my cure that I came here for, and then a little about the spiritual state I was in when I came here. So um, medically, I was diagnosed in January of 2021 with a rare type of ovarian cancer called granulosa cell tumor. Have any of you ever heard of that? Yeah, I hadn't either. I'm, I'm a doctor and I have a PhD and I'd never heard of it. So anyway, the doctor told me that I was probably just going to be a little spot in one ovary. But when they got to surgery, it turned out it was all of both ovaries and that it had broken up and scattered all over the inside of my, my pelvis and that it was stage three. So I came back and he said, well, if you start chemo, you've got about a 50% chance of living five years. And I said, well, I'm not going to do chemo. I'm going to try to heal this some other way. So I've been following it with scans, which have always been negative and also what they call liquid biopsies, you know, where they take a blood test and they look for cancer cells and cancer DNA, and the liquid biopsies have always been positive. So I'm gonna back off for a moment and talk a little about my spiritual background, which is very different from many of the people I've heard talk here. So I started out in Catholic school and I really loved it. I was one of those kids who'd sneak out of recess to go spend some time with Jesus and Mary. Um, I went to a school where there were 50 kids in a class, and the nuns coped by having the brighter kids tutor the slower kids. And it turned out I was pretty good at that. In fact, I was so good that by 
in third grade, my teacher pretty much put me in charge of the class a lot of the time. She'd give me the teaching uh, notes for the day, and she'd take off for a couple hours. <laughs> and then she'd come back, and you know, I was sort of like an underage, unpaid, uncertified teaching assistant. <laughs> well, eventually the nuns and the principal found out about this, and they let her go at the end of the year, but they also said I had to go at the end of the year. Yeah, I don't quite, and I felt it was very unfair, but I had to leave Catholic school. And so I kind of took my spiritual feelings and put them in a box to kind of put away for some other day. And I said, well, if you don't want me, I'll find someone who does. And I went into being a scientist, and I was a very good science student. I ended up going to MIT and Harvard Medical School, and um, I really excelled. But there were some challenges in that because, as many of you might know, um, a lot of those people are, are atheists. I've read surveys, it's over 95% of these sort of higher level achieving biologists. And I, I appreciated your story about how your doctor looked at you like you had a third eye. It wasn't always quite that way for me. I found they looked at me like I'd sprouted a second head if I tried to talk about something spiritual. But I guess it's a different sect of atheists. Anyway. So, so getting back to the current story. So nerd that I am, I was reading all about people who had remissions from cancer, what they did, how they acted. And, um, you know, I could do the diet, I could do the supplements, but I realized I, a lot of people who have a spiritual path, a spiritual component, survive disease much better, including cancer, and I realized that was a big weakness for me. And uh, actually, that was around when I met Marilyn Linnell and James, and they told me about the Little Chapel. And I came here first in January of 2022. And um, on my first visit, Sarah gave me a, a special message, and it was about the Holy Spirit and having the, Holy, the power of the Holy Spirit in people's lives. And I was touched by it, but I was sort of like, but that's not my cancer cure. You know? <laughs> what happened to my cancer cure? Anyway, though, I kept coming back, and I had sort of this ongoing argument between my head and my heart. My heart wanted to believe but my head was, yes, but, yes, but, you know, I've lived in the atheistic world for so long. Finally, at Christmas, Sarah again gave me a message about the Holy Spirit and the strength of the Holy Spirit. And that time I was, I was able to open my heart and I had my first phase of cure, I think, which was I was able to surrender the issue to God. And a lot of the fear I was feeling dissipated my anxiety levels went down. I wasn't obsessing about it all the time. You know, when you, I don't know, at least for me, like every time I'd be going for blood tests was such an emotional roller coaster, you know, and that leveled out. I just feel God will do whatever's right. And I hope it's a cure, but you know, even if it's not, then God knows what's best. And then I had the second um, part of my cure, which was I went in for my usual quarterly blood biopsy, and for the first time, there were no tumor cells or tumor DNA on my biopsy. So I just, just so it took about a year for, for me to reach that stage, and I think I still have further to go. But I want to urge people, be patient, hang in there. Many of us may have different reasons why the spirit feels we're not quite ready for a cure. In my case, it was spiritual blockage. It might be other things. But give it time and uh, trust in God. Dear Heavenly Father, right now, we wish to go into the stillness of you, Lord. It's the time we align ourselves with the Holy Spirit. And we feel the presence of you very real to each one of us. Perhaps you've tried everything to be healed of your pain and it just hasn't worked for you. Perhaps you've been attempting to create something in your life and it hasn't happened. 
Perhaps it's necessary for you to look at your motivation. Perhaps what you're trying to create is not in alignment with your mission or your true destiny. God loves you enough to not let an act hinder or sidetrack you in some way if you're looking to Him. We ask you, Lord, to not let us get sidetracked, to stop us. We plead with you, stop us in our own self-destruction. We want to fulfill that divine plan you have for each of us. We look to you for your healing touch and ask you to come into our hearts and soul. We open ourselves completely to the Holy Spirit at this time, this very moment. You tell us to ask, ask. Mark Victor Hansen wrote a book called Ask. He's here today like he usually is with his dear wife, Crystal. They've written many spiritual books, but this book, Ask, 739 times in the Bible, the word ask is brought in. So you have to ask today. You have not because you ask not quite frequently. We just ask of you, Jesus, through your power, that power of the Holy Spirit to go through these people that are here, some who have lost their, their whole being thinking nothing is worthwhile. Let them know you're here for them.